Hi, I'm Dave Jones and welcome to the EE Vlog number 4. As you might know, I've got a bit of an interest in calculators and some time back I noticed that Hewlett Packard, um, they actually released the HP 20B financial calculator. Now, I don't have much interest in financial calculators, but uh, one spec caught my eye and that was the fact that it ran at 30 megahertz. Now, that just seemed, uh, you know, uh, quite high. I couldn't believe it. Wow, 30 megahertz for a financial calculator? Unbelievable. So I decided to check into it. Now, the HP 20B uses uh, the new Atmel um, ARM processor. It's the SAM 7L series, and it's quite a nice, nice device. It's really designed for low power operation. It's got uh, 0.5 milliamps per megahertz uh, power consumption, which is really quite low. Now the uh, Atmel ARM chip is actually quite smart. You can actually dynamically change its clock speed um, as you're going. So, so the code can actually change the clock speed. So what you can do in a calculator design is that uh, when you need to, when you're actually performing the calculation, you can speed it up as fast as you want to help speed up the calculation. And then when it's sitting there idle, just waiting for a key press, you can drop it right down to 32 kilohertz or something. Now, if the chip can operate at 30 megahertz, it kind of makes sense when you're doing the calculation to up it to its highest frequency possible. Uh, because everyone knows that um, if you uh, speed up something 10 times, it takes one tenth the time to do that calculation to perform that operation as it does at a frequency 10 times less. So why not just bump it up in speed? So let's do some back of the envelope calculation, shall we? Now the HP 20B is powered from two standard CR2032 coin cell batteries and they have a characteristic which looks something like this. This is the internal resistance in ohms, and this is time, and it starts off and heads up like that. Now it starts off around 15 ohms, and you know, it starts going off the scale at about 100 towards the end of the life, and at about half life it's about 20 ohms or thereabouts. Now let's have a look at what effect this has on our operation at higher frequencies. Right, so let's do a model of the calculator. We've got the coin cell battery, we've got an internal resistance, and we've got the calculator itself. Now we've already said this is 15 ohms, but because they're using two in parallel, let's go 7.5 ohms. We have current I, and we want to know the power that's being wasted in this internal battery resistance. So let's call that uh, PR. Okay, now at 30 megahertz, let's have a look at what loss we get in the internal battery resistance. PR is equal to 15 milliamps because we said the uh, device has. 0.5 milliamps per megahertz power consumption. So if we're operating at 30 megahertz, we're using 15 milliamps. Now that's squared times uh, 7.5 ohms. And that gives us an answer of roughly 1.7 milliwatts loss in the battery resistance. Now that doesn't sound like much, but let's compare it when it operates at one tenth that frequency. So let's do the same again, but this time at 3 megahertz. The power in the resistor equals, this time it's uh, only going to be 1.5 milliamps squared times 7.5 ohms. And that's going to be about 17 microwatts. But I know what you're thinking. Because we're operating at 3 megahertz, we need 10 times the uh, 10 times the amount of time to actually do the same operation as we would at 30 megahertz. So let's multiply that by 10, and we get 170 microwatts 
four oh, per second. Now, these two figures, you can see that at three megahertz, it takes, we have one tenth the loss in the battery as we do at 30 megahertz. So, what have we proven with this little calculation? Well, we've proven that it's the squared factor which gets you, the I squared factor in power consumption which really gets you. And you have to take into account the internal battery resistance in low power designs like this if you're operating at high frequency. Because the 20B calculator is wasting at minimum 5% uh, of its consumption is being taken up by the internal battery, battery resistance. And that's just going to get worse uh, as the battery ages because of this curve here. It just gets worse with time. So it's not too bad, you know, losing 5% in your internal batteries isn't too bad right down at this point. But when you get right up to here, it's, you know, when you get towards the end of the battery life, it's getting quite severe. And it's really just poor engineering. Um, not much thought has gone into it. They've just upped it to the highest possible frequency, 30 megahertz, and really not given much thought to the internal battery resistance. So just take it into account next time you're designing something like this. I came across a rather interesting fact the other day while I was searching another engineering blog site, actually. It was the uh, Subversive Guide to Engineering site. And they had a list of the top 10 uh, famous people who were engineers. And one I had no idea about was Rowan Atkinson, Mr. Bean. Incredible. He actually has a degree in electronics engineering and also a master's from Oxford. Who knew? Mr. Bean. Can you imagine having Mr. Bean working on your project? Or Mr. Bean at your design review meeting? Awesome. Now it's time for another thing that really ticks me off. This time it's uh, FPGAs, Field Programmable Gate Arrays. Now, I like FPGAs, I use them a lot. But uh, one thing that's ticked me off over the years is that you've never really been able to get uh, the high logic density devices in small packages, in ones that you can use for prototyping, like, you know, a simple quad flat pack or something like that. Uh, they all come in BGAs, and this was this was really bad uh, four or five years ago. It was it was shocking. You couldn't get a single FPGA on the market that wasn't in a big BGA package. They uh, the manufacturers seem obsessed with high pin count, high I/O, and high number of I/O devices. So if you wanted a, um, a you know a couple hundred thousand logic element device, a really high density one you were forced to use this 1,000-pin BGA package. It was crazy. It's, uh, it's actually getting a bit better these days. The manufacturers um, are starting to release, you know, a little 44-pin quad flat pack devices, things like that, but they're, but they're still only low density. So, you know, they actually have, they have fairly limited use. Um, so, really, I don't know what's stopping them. You know, a, a couple of hundred thousand gate high-density device, you know, you know, a DIP28. Beautiful. I get a lot of questions about my scientific calculator watch project, the micro watch. One of the most asked questions is, where do I get the little compact LCD display that I use in the watch from? The answer is I get it from JCAR, but many people don't realize it's an industry standard size. It's 53 by 20 millimeters, which is really tiny. And it's a standard two-line by 16 character LCD display. It uses the standard LCD chipset, so it's compatible with your existing code. And they're just real handy. There's probably four, five, six different manufacturers out there that I'm aware of, at least, that make this exact uh, one with the same mounting holes, the same dimensions, 53 by 20 millimeters. And they're really handy. So look at specking one into your next project because they're just great for all sorts of apps.